Hello and welcome to the Wham Theater Spotlight series. In this series, Wham invites audiences into conversations with some of this season's groundbreaking theater artists to learn about their process and how their work intersects with activism. I'm Tatiana Godfrey, uh, and I'm a dramaturg and teaching artist at Wham Theater. Today, I'll be talking with Victor Vasquez, who is the founder and leading casting director of X Casting, about some of the problems that we run into in the traditional casting process, especially in terms of racial or gender stereotyping, and some of the opportunities and suggestions he has for better ways of placing actors in roles. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude and humility that Wham Theater is based on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here today, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Please check out the land acknowledgement page on our website and join us in some of the action steps that we are taking. Um, and I'd like to welcome Victor. Hi, what's up? Hey, Tatiana. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Of course. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. So you're a, a casting director. Can you Talk about what that is, like what do you do? Sure, of course. <laughs> so casting, um, the casting directors exist in all sorts of mediums, right? It's, um, we know them uh, to exist in entertainment, right? In television and film, uh, also in theater, right? Um, in the commercial space, in audiobooks, what we listen to, right? Um, and so it's, it's really for me, uh, it, the way that I think about my job might be different than most casting directors think about their jobs, but I really think about it as a curatorial process, but with people at center, right? And, and those people being the actors, importantly, right? Um, and for me, it's really about how we help co-imagine the world with directors, with artists, right? What are the worlds that they're imagining and how can we also help co-create and co-imagine that world? So two words in there that I, I really like to use are um, the imagination, right? And also a curatorial process. I, I do draw, I'm a dramaturg. And so I love the idea of it being a cur that you're curating this experience, like this acting experience. <laughs> for a specific project. That's a brilliant way of thinking of it that I like never thought of before. I'm gonna ruminate more on that. That, that something about that really excites me. Mm. Um, how did you first get involved with Wham? So uh, I, I first met Kristen back at uh, Arena Stage in Washington DC when she was directing a production of Anne. And I think that was in, uh, if not 2016, 2017, started to become familiar with her and her work. Um, and then I uh, was able to support a WAM project uh, in the casting process. Uh, I believe it was Roe um, back in 2020. And um, just a big fan of Kristen, big fan of the company. Um, yeah. Yeah, Roe, I was an assistant dramaturg on Roe. Nice. Um, and I thought, I thought it turned out really nicely. That was our like first foray into... Uh, like digital theater. It was a theater right. piece that like, was recorded and, and put together. Um, how, how has, like, how has your job changed since theater wasn't happening for a while? Right. I mean, it, it wasn't happening for a while. That is a big statement because that's real, right? For a lot of us. Um, I remember there was about an eight month hiatus um, before things sort of started coming back into uh, uh, into production. But um, I have to say that it's been a very helpful time um, because I think it forced a lot of us onto the same page, right? To start having conversations that are important. I launched my company in 2019, Xcasting. Um, and for me, back then, I was in New York City looking around and wondering how is this part of the industry moving forward into this new future, right? 
And seeing that a lot of the casting offices, I mean, primarily when we're thinking about Broadway, off-Broadway, New York City, and even regionally, because a lot of regional theaters hire casting directors in New York City to find actors who then go off into these communities, right? Um, what I was wondering was like, where are the people of color? Where are the non-Anglo, non-white, non-Caucasian folks who are also co-imagining these worlds, right? With a creative team, because I, I know it to be true because I'm in it that, and this is an Adrian Marie Brown quote, who if y'all are not familiar with Adrian Marie Brown, brilliant, brilliant thinker, brilliant person, uh, first wrote um, Emergent Strategy. And so in Emergent Strategy, the book, there's this really beautiful quote that says, what I pay attention to grows. And it's really, when you sort of think about the simplicity of that statement, right? It's a mission statement in itself. What I pay attention to grows. And so therefore it's important to think and consider, and there's a huge responsibility in what I pay attention to. And so for me, what I was really thinking, you know, I was, I was walking, I was host holding auditions just nonstop. That's a big part of my job is meeting actors, being in the privacy of a studio space, seeing them, you know, attempt a take on a character before the world ever sees it, right? Which is like a private lab sort of like beautiful moment that always happens. And one of the things that I kept noticing in the audition room back in 2017, 2018, 2019, was that there was a lot of POC, Black, queer folks walking into rooms. And it was as if the room had held some sort of traumatic experience for them. And so they were walking into it and I didn't like, it was, it was as if, as if the room was not allowing them to show up as their full selves. And I, I mean, I went after seeing thousands and thousands of actors, right. You start to notice, or I was making this observation and so I just had a hypothesis and I was like, well, clearly it seems that this room has been harmful and there's a narrative, a myth, a real realness, right? All of that to be true, that these rooms can and have perpetuated harm. So how can we think about countering that to help these rooms and the people behind the table ensure that we're providing a safe creative space for actors to come and play and particularly actors who are uh, POC, who are black, who are queer, who are non-binary, who are trans, right? Who we are centering them in these rooms. And so that became a huge question for me. And I didn't endeavor to provide a solution. I endeavored to find out why, why, why this is happening. And I still think that I'm part, I'm, 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 I'm still in that journey, right? But there are little sort of like switches that I know are, we're activating to ensure that we're transforming that in a, uh, with time. What does that practically look like? Yeah, I mean, I think it really looks like who's behind the table, right? I think it looks like implementing really simple practices sometimes that allows somebody to enter a room safely, right? So like, for instance, this is such an easy sort of pivot, right? But I like to greet actors at the door. I also like to check in with them outside, right? So me as a casting director, um, I'll either check in with the actor outside or I'll, um, I'll check in with them right as they come in. And I just go, hey, you know, I just want to talk you through the experience, right? What you're about to walk into. Let me paint the room for you. Um, when you come in, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves with their pronouns. And then we'll turn to you and you can introduce yourself um, next, right? So that we are facilitating that introduction first. But this is what that does for me in the back end, right? Is that suddenly as the actor enters, we're not putting the onus on them to introduce themselves. 
or not even allowing them to introduce themselves, right? It's always that awkward sort of moment. And so even in just allowing the room to introduce themselves, right? Hi, I'm XYZ, uh, he, they pronouns, director. Hi, I am XYZ, she, they pronouns, playwright. Hi, I'm the dramaturg. Hi, I'm, right? I'm the reader and hey, I'm Victor, we just met. And uh, we'll turn it over to you, right? And now the person feels like they've met everybody in the room and they're like, oh, hi, my name is XYZ. Now that I've seen everybody use the model of modeling pronouns, I'm not the only one participating in that. So I will model sharing my pronouns as well. And um, it's great to be here, right? So for me, it's like little changes like that that that, that really... Um, help I think stack up and create a new scaffolding to welcome a person in their wholeness into the room. That's brilliant. I I adore that. It's like, yeah, there's like a very small practical thing that, that you can implement. I definitely um I would consider myself a, a classically trained actor. Uh and I played I played a lot of black maids. I'm also not, I guess, like tra the, traditionally what people consider like beautiful and like a large black woman, um, which like me, I play a lot of older characters too, because I guess those two are equate for somehow. Um, and then uh, something that I've noticed is that I started getting more and different opportunities after the death of George Floyd, which I think also just because it intersected in, in the pandemic, um, something about that time allowed for more work to more and different work to to be made. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you might be able to comment on that trend or where where do you see uh, what was your job like before in the before times and how is it different now? First, let me go back to what you were speaking of, of, um, you know, the way that you've been cast, right? And I don't, I do not, I don't think that there is, here, how do I, it's a complex thought. So let me, let me, let me, let me slow down a little bit. The word cast versus the word cast, cased, right? As in cast system, um, aren't too far from one another. And, and the reason I say that is because when we think about casting as, you know, in TV and film on Broadway, in commercials, right? Um, in advertisement, right? Um, in the way that we listen to books now and audio and audio versions, there is a homogeny present. Right. And, and and that homogeny is also present behind the table in terms of those who make the decisions. Right. And it's not um, it is it is a known sort of observation. Right. That lots of casting directors, for the most part, are white, are Caucasian or Anglo. Right. And that there's a, a, an imagination that is central to their experience, right? Particularly if you're cis, if you're straight, right? And then you start adding all these intersections, right? So then when you think about how the world is imagined through one lens, then we have a problem, right? Then we start having conversations about type. And I find conversations about type to be problematic because it, we're asking a one group to imagine how they see other people, right? And it's limiting. And we know this because, right, then we have certain shows like Star Trek who finally have a Black woman as a captain in outer space. It's outer space. Like even in space, we have types, right? Like the fact that this franchise that's existed for decades just now 
moves into the space of imagining a black woman as a captain in outer space. To me, what that says is that we have a problem with the way that we're imagining people. And my solution is not so much that we have to train people to imagine differently, is that we have to let other people imagine the world, right? We have to let non-binary folks, trans folks, right? Um, folks with disabilities. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the child of two immigrants from Mexico. Spanish is my first language. I was born in Los Angeles. And I grew up here in, in South Central for 30 years, right? And I now live in New York City, but my imagination is quite different because of my experience. And so when I look at a page or a script or a story, I'm contextualizing that world through my experience. And I'm sure that others are doing the same too. And so the fact that we cannot imagine a person as something beyond what we think or we're putting on them is a problem with our imagination. And so why not let other people who see you, right, Tatiana, as in your wholeness or even beyond that, right, to see you in ways that you don't even see yourself, to then say, to have them usher a, a, a curatorial process of casting to put you in a story where you're the president of the United States, right? Like that is, I think, the power of what it means to, to put people behind these decision-making moments and allow them to imagine the world differently. I don't know if I answered your question, but I wanted to address that first part first. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think about the gatekeepers that exist um, like I'm one of them now. I'm, I'm working as a, as a literary manager at a pretty major uh, theater. And like, what plays are even getting passed forward for people to do? Right. Yeah. And that all the gatekeepers that got, who were like, hey, this person's cool and interesting. We should see what they're about. Have all, all been white on that journey for me. Right. Yeah. I, I was, there's this are, quote where, yeah. Scar, go ahead. No, please. No, this is, I just remember somebody saying like, oh, they were talking about themselves, but they're like, I'm such a terrible gatekeeper because I just, you know, it's like, just let people in. And it's like, yeah, that's part of it. Right. It's like, it's, there's this, there's this thing about access where we think that there, you know, we, we know that there are, are limited amount of slots in a season, in a cast, right. We know that. But for me, the way that I think about that role of gatekeeper is um, like I always tell actors, I'm like, when you go into an audition room, this is not a pass fail binary, right? We, we I think in a Western construct have such an addiction to this binary of pass fail because we, we were conditioned in it in an educational setting for 12 years right? Most of us. And so then we attach that same binary to everything, an audition room, a job application, right? Uh, sending you our play to then say, not today. Oh, I failed. Okay. Rejection, right? But for me, I think about the audition room as a meeting point. And it's a really great opportunity for me to meet you as an artist, right? Might not be the right part, or the right play or the right collaboration with this director or writer. But guess what? I recreate this room over and over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times a year, thousands of times, right? In a number of years. And if it's not this project, it's gonna be another one. So that meeting point is about meeting an artist in the room and assessing, right? How how did I fail to understand this artist from a one page resume? And now that I meet them in person, what are they adding to my understanding of them 
so that I can better like curate those projects to bring to them next time. So it's really an adjustment on my end too, to then say, oh, okay, I didn't get that right this time, but this person's brilliant. Like they, they walk in with the X, like, you know, X, Y, Z personality traits. I saw them in their range. I'm really interested in playing with them in another space with another artist, with another playwright. Right. So I just want to sort of like remind people that, um, that, that, that is an important thing to remember. Do not come in and bring in this binary into the room. You won't, it won't, you cannot sustain that. Sustainability. That's, that's helpful. That's helpful to hear. I'm like, just been listening to him like wow this is genius this is a great interview I've just been thinking that as you're speaking I'm like oh people can take away a lot from this um and and speaking of you were you were saying I, I want people to know this to hear this um you you teach acting at NYU right. nice that's that's my alma mater from years years back nice. Yes. Yeah, I teach um, a, a Tish fourth year, so I get them right before they're about to go into the world, which is, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> what a tender, tender time in their lives. Right. Right. Uh, what are some tenets that you hope they're taking away? I, um, you know, I talk to my students a lot about them as artists, and I remind them of this because I think in a lot of ways, um, we train our actors to we train our actors to try to fit into an industry that's always fast evolving that we can't really quite keep up with right and and I think that the way that you remain right stable through that or sustain yourself through that is to just always come back to yourself as the artist right and in that, like for me, there's an understanding there because I have to contextualize for them why I'm saying this. And I tell them that there's been a real um, intervention into their artistry, right? By a business, right? And, and that business can be capitalism. It could be, right, just the business of, Broadway theater, regional theater, selling tickets, right? Um, TV, film, anything, right? And I think the acknowledgement that I have to, that I want them to understand is that they're not a commodity. And there's been a real, a presence of a commodification of their artistry for quite some time. Because in that cycle, as we've seen it through the Me Too movement, through, you know, artists um, uh, now like speaking up about sort of the culture of on set in rehearsal rooms in et cetera, being toxic, problematic, et cetera, right? For me, the, the reason that that exists is because there's this commodification of their, their artistry, right? that commodification then tries to objectify them, right? Meaning that it makes them into objects, actors as objects who are movable because they are only granted value when they're valuable to a project, right? And then in that cycle, right? What that then leads to is dehumanization, right? And that's when we see violence enacted upon these actors, right? Through directors, through producers, through casting directors, um, through folks who have um, um, hierarchical power over them, right? And so the way that I tell them that they can disrupt that is to not feed into that culture. They're not an object they're not a commodity they're an artist and so that's what i mean when i try to have them understand how central that um identification is how 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 special it is and how i don't want them to introduce this cycle into it by enabling it 
That's great. It's a like a change in thinking. Right. Yeah. Uh, because we, yeah, we have been conditioned, especially by one through the act, you know, one of the acting programs, to to right. think about myself as a commodity. And I'm like, no, that's not a that's not true. I'm not worth. I'm not. My worth is not equal to my like efficiency and my productivity. Right, and it's like you know, it's 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 something that we've seen sort of like just cake in, right? It's caked in into the culture of our everyday. Um, we, I tell them, I'm like, I don't like to use the word networking, right? So I'm like, when you graduate and you go into the world, don't network, connect. I'm like, these are two different strategies, mm. networking and connecting, not the same thing, right? One of them operates within this sort of like cycle, right? Um, of business, of capitalism, of like commodification, of objectification, right? Of like, how are you valuable to me and how am I valuable to you? While the other one connecting, it's really, I tell them like, this is, you can live a really fantastic life as an artist and sustain yourself by living in the philosophy of connection. And that means that you then see this industry, not so much as an industry, but an ecosystem as an environment that you get to nourish and that gets to nourish you. So how do you participate in that? I'm like, that for me is more sustainable than the other. And I'm, I tell them like, that's how I operate. And if you want to go that way, good luck. I don't think you're going to make it out alive, you know, but here, at least you are surrounded by people who get to remind you of what's core to you, which is you as an artist with a capital A. Uh, what are some uh, some plays, media, cultural touchstones that you're that you're living for right now? Okay, I, I literally just took a break right now to talk to you because I needed to catch up on RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. Yes. <laughs> I really love the art of drag. I think it's really uh, beautiful and I love it. Um, let's see, what else? I really, really love, um, uh, oh my God, what's that meta universe movie? Uh, everything everywhere all at once or what was yeah, it called yeah 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 is that, is that what it's called yeah. something like that loved it i thought i thought uh i thought it was just a real kick in my imagination um i listened to drake's album last night his new album it was a good sort of workout album <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you know, I try to keep up, but uh, those are three things that are coming to top of mind. But I think the one thing that I, I also love books, so maybe I'll talk a little bit about book real quick. I know we're almost at time. Uh, since I just mentioned TV, music, and a film, I'll then go into literary space. Um, if y'all folks are looking for a book, um, I really recommend The Art of Gathering. Um, it's a book that came out in 2020 by Priya Parker. She... Uh, her past was in conflict resolution on large scale conflicts. So it was between communities that were at war, who had trauma or historical trauma between them. Um, so then she takes this concept of really thinking about gatherings and, and starts to put down a sort of methodology about how we gather in simple small spaces and large ones, right? And so I just recommend it for everybody because it was really revolutionary for me and the way I think about casting, but I think it can be applied to anything, right? Because she really some she really defines a gathering as a moment where more two or more people meet. So it could be a dinner, it could be a date, it could be um, a funeral, it could be a service, it could be a birthday, it could be a meeting, it could be a board meeting, right? Like she she really um, puts down a really beautiful methodology that helps us think about gathering as an artful intention. And so I really, really recommend that. 
What a brilliant note to end on, uh, because that book was definitely a guiding theme for planning our season at Wham. So if you're watching, read the book and then come see shows at Wham. Oh, I love that. That's really beautiful. Uh, yeah, Victor, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll see you around. All right, bye.